and I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. I have one short verse of scripture that I want to read, and then I want to uh, talk to you this morning about our children. In 3 John chapter 1 and verse 4, uh, John wrote here, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Let us look to the Lord. Father, we love you this morning. We're just thankful for you, Lord, and thankful for your goodness. Uh, Lord, you're the, the, the center and all there is as far as the good things in this life and in this world. And I just pray that you would bless this message this morning. Uh, Lord, just be with me as I share these words with the congregation. Have your way, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated uh, if you wish. Uh, I want to talk about our children this morning. I am, uh, have some very strong feelings about the family unit. I think it's the center of everything that is good and old, whether it be uh, in our community, in our, our uh, local family, in the church, in our nation, wherever you look. If you have strong families, you're going to have strong whatever. Uh, in the nation, you'll have, if you have strong families, you have a strong, you'll have a strong nation. In, uh, in the state we live in, if we have strong families, we'll have a strong state. And the counties and the cities and our homes and our churches, etc. every element of our life, in order to be really successful and, and have good, strong uh, uh, gatherings or whatever, it requires strong families. Family is the center of all of this. I was thinking about this, and, and I have a lot. I, I preached this message, only I preached it different at, at, at a conference one year. And, uh, and I talked about something that has happened that I... I wanted to bring to the attention of the churches that was all there at the conference. Uh, several, many years ago, uh, I was the youth coordinator for the Southern California Apostolic Fellowship. And uh, my wife and I put the youth camp on every year. And we, uh, we used to have some youth rallies and times at the fellowship meetings and so forth. There was about uh, about 12 churches uh, in all that was involved in this and we have we would have kids from uh, all those different churches at the youth camps and all of these things we would have uh, sometimes a hundred kids at these youth camps and it was my job to put the program on to set the rules for the camp and enforce them uh, in order to have a good uh, youth camp and where everybody could enjoy themselves and have a good time. And I, it was my job to select a speaker for the camp every year and all of these things. And I look back now at all of this, and I, I did this for eight years I was in charge. And I look back now and I ask myself, where are all of those kids today that was at those youth camps? I have heard from, I think, two of those kids, of all of those kids. Now, I know that some of them moved away to other places and so forth, and I hope and pray that they're going to church someplace, but for the most part, most of them are not going to church at all. I think it's a pretty sad situation in our churches today, and I don't have the statistics this morning, I want to get them before. Uh, I'm going to spend more time on this than just today. Uh, I want to get the statistics before uh, I finish this. But uh, for children that comes to church, and the statistics that I have just pertain to children that go to church on a regular basis, just those. Uh, the statistics doesn't address those children that just come once in a while or just came a couple times or those things. 
Uh, we used to have, when I pastored in, in California, uh, we had a 12-passenger van, Ford van, and my wife used to go out before church on Sunday morning, and she would bring as many as three loads of kids to church. And of all those kids that I know of, I don't know of any of them that's still going to church and serving God. Now I know that there is many cases where when children become adults that they walk away from the Lord and later on in life they come back to church. That's what happened in my life and uh, that happens to a lot of people. But you know I think there's a better way. I really believe there's a better way and that's what I want to share with you this morning. So. Uh, I want to kind of look at my notes here. Uh, the age that I want to look at is between 15 and 18, when kids are, are, are between the ages of 15 and 18, is when most kids that go to church on a regular basis, that's when they quit going to church, uh, ages 15 to 18. The most unchurched age in America is between 18 and 25. That's the most unchurched age in America. I think that's pretty sad. Uh, so as we look at this, uh, I, 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 uh, I want to look at, at, at uh, several categories. Let me see, I got four, seven categories that I want to look at, and I, and I want to share with you uh, what, what the problem is in all of these different categories. Why do our kids quit coming to church? Uh, so I want to look at, uh, first of all, the, the area that I want to look at, and some of these categories overlap each other, so you can't put them all in one, but the first area that I want to look at is parents. Parents. Is parents to blame for uh, their kids not going to church once they become adults? And a big part, and in fact, uh, I think they have to shoulder the greatest responsibility. Parents do. and. Uh, now I know that, uh, and I, I want to say this before I go any further, I know that there's uh, a lot of parents that has made mistakes and, and their children have suffered because of it and I don't want to, it's not my intention this morning to put a guilt trip on anybody this morning. What you've done in the past, you can't go back and undo it. Uh, but, the, but the purpose of my message this morning is is for our children that's coming up that's going to have their own children and also uh, when we have families come to our church that is fits some of these categories I'd like for all of us to be prepared to help minister to those families and help them so that this doesn't happen to their children because when you think about this I, I, I'd like for you to really think about the seriousness of this how serious is it when a child becomes an adult and quits coming to church and has nothing to do with God? How serious is that? There isn't anything that could be more serious. Because those children, unless down the road they come back to the Lord, those children are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. They're not going to spend eternity with us in heaven if they've walked away from the Lord and don't come back to the Lord. So. This is very serious and it's something we need to look at and we need to address this correctly and I'm going to share some things with this morning that uh, may surprise some of you, this, so, but, uh, but I want to really look at this and, and uh, I think that one thing, and I, I, I think about something that I heard from a man that I was working with and everybody really respected this man and so forth, but I, I want to tell you something that this man said one time. And uh, I don't think he really realized the seriousness of his remark and what he was really saying, but I do believe he really meant it. He said, I'm not going to have a bunch of kids 
And the children that I do have, I think he had three or four children. He had twin girls, and he had at least one son, maybe two, I don't remember. But he made this statement. He said, I'm not going to live my life and spend all my time doing things for my kids. I'm going to, to design my life and plan things so that I can enjoy myself and have a good time all my life. And that's my goal for life. Uh, and I thought, how sad it is for a man to feel that way about his children, that he's not willing to sacrifice uh, some of the pleasures that he enjoys for the benefit of his children. But you know, I believe that that element exists within our churches in many cases. Uh, and that's something that everybody needs to look at themselves. So uh, I think that's a big thing that is, that is incorrect uh, for uh, uh, parents. And I believe that it's the parent's responsibility to create a culture in their home, mainly, uh, and the church to embrace and support them. Uh, so that they can have a culture that their ch kids can grow up in and can grow up knowing the Lord and, and having a lifetime commitment to the Lord. Uh, I, I am blessed uh, I, with my children. They are all serving the Lord. They, all, they didn't, one of them didn't, at, at least when he was uh, pretty young. He, well, he never did actually make a commitment to the Lord until he was about 18 years old. And then that commitment, he has been true to that commitment to this day, and he's 57 years old today. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really proud of my kids, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I have to give my, uh, their mother uh, uh, the credit uh, more than, uh, than anything else. But... Uh, we need to have a, 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 what's the word I want to use here, an atmosphere and a, and a culture within our homes. Uh, we, we need to have a worldview that we support and that we hold dear to. And there's a lot of things that can be sent. And so I'm just kind of covering the, the surface here this morning, and I want to preach more about this in future Sundays. So, parents... That's the, that's the big thing, is parents needs to uh, do their part in raising their kids. So another enemy that we have, and I'm not calling parents enemies, <laughs> but uh, there's elements in our society that we need to look at. And I'll tell you another element, the second one that I want to look at is movies. I want to look at Hollywood. Uh, did you know that Hollywood actually sets the tone and sets the standard for the moral behavior and morals and ethics, the ethical behaviors and so forth for our nation. Did you know that? They really do. And, and there's people watch us movies all the time. Our society is, is uh, uh, just uh, inundated with movies and stuff and they watch movies they, whether it's down at the movie house or whether it's on TV uh, or things they watch on the internet or, or uh, uh, DVDs or whatever they happen to be, there's all kinds of things out there that is bringing ungodly attitudes and, uh, and, uh, and moral uh, values and so forth, bringing them into our homes and is setting the standard our kids especially will begin to pattern after those things because they are presented as if this is the right lifestyle to live. And so these movies begins to uh, it really influence and hurt our children and really works against what we are trying to do in the church to uh, see people saved and remain saved and stay saved until they die. And that's our goal for the church. We want everybody to make heaven their home. Uh, once you uh, get through with this life, uh, uh, then you're going to look back on it. When you see Jesus, you're going to look back on this life and you're going to think what a short period of time this life was and any sacrifices and, 
and all that you had to make for the Lord so that you could be in heaven for eternity is going to be worth it many, many, many times over. And so uh, we need to, to be willing to, to live for the Lord and to embrace and support the things of God. And so movies is a, is a big enemy towards the family, the family unit. And, and uh, it, it, you can watch many movies where it shows how that people rebels against their parents and, and how successful they are in doing so and how they have gained a better life and, and all of these things that, uh, that they have because they follow the pattern they see uh, from movies on TV and at the movie house and so forth. When I was growing up, I, we went to churches that was very legalistic and we wasn't allowed to ever go see a movie. And, and I thought that was really wrong. Well, I really have to question my ideas uh, nowadays because of that. And we need to be, uh, we, if we go to movies, we need to very, be very selective on the kind of movies that we go and see and we allow our kids to see. The next thing that I want to look at that really harms uh, the family unit and that uh, really gets in the way of children growing up and remaining true to the Lord is the internet. Now I want you to think about the internet and think about all the stuff that is available in, on the internet. There's things on the internet that is available from around the world, not just here in America, but around the world, but here in America. And so kids have access to uh, computers. And in fact, uh, in uh, most school systems today, kids are required to use computers. And so here we have these computers uh, and uh, I, I believe in most cases that these computers are not policed by the parents, uh, at least as well as they should be. So what is wrong with computers? You might ask me this morning, what is wrong with computers? Well, I want to tell you something. I want to share, uh, talk about these computers for just a moment. What kind of stuff goes on on these computers? Well, one thing that goes uh, on a computer which is, uh, computers is the biggest source of pornography that there is. Did you know that? It's the biggest source that there is. And, and uh, you know when kids start watching pornography on, on, uh, on the internet? When they're eight, nine years old, and some probably before that. And, and pornography will actually destroy your life, and especially if you're a Christian, it will destroy your relationship with God. Uh, and you should not get involved in that. But I'll tell you something else that's bad on, on the internet, and that's chat rooms. Chat rooms. Because our kids is influenced by other kids, and especially kids that is older than your kids, and your kids watching them, and so forth. And so these chat rooms is terrible. And there's things that goes on on, uh, and I want to go to smartphones. In fact, I think I'll group that together with the internet, uh, with a uh, out on their own. I forget all the statistics, but let me just share the other end of the spectrum. Kids that goes to school, that goes to church on a regular school on a regular basis. They go to a family integrated church. That's what our church is and they uh, are homeschooled, something like 97% of them continues to serve God when they become adults. Now our churches ought to look at this. And I shared those statistics when I preached this message at that conference that year. Uh, you know what? We need to be serious about our kids. And, and I thank God that we are in this church and that we have a family integrated church and, and that parents are homeschooling their kids. And I, I, was, I was excited when, when Nick started coming to our church. And, and one thing that I was really excited about is that he was already homeschooling his boys. And I, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, and and it, 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 if, we, if we look at all of this and, and, uh, and, and just 
take it all in and ask ourselves what we should do and how should we raise our kids and, and how should we, uh, you know, train them in church and so forth. And by the way, did you know that there's not one scripture in the Bible that says that the church corporate is supposed to train children? And yet, almost every Christian church in America thinks that the church's responsibility is to train children. But there's not one scripture in the Bible that says that. Not one. It says, fathers, train up your children. That's what the Bible says. I want to read something here. Now, I've given you the negative. I know this has been a negative message this morning. And I I'm, I'm just want to share facts with you. Uh, because we love our kids, and we want them to grow up loving God and, and being wholesome uh, assets to the community and so forth. That's what we want, isn't it? Uh, and so forth. I want to read this that I've written down here. And this is what it was like when I was a kid. I know that's a long time ago. But uh, listen to what this says. There was a time when the community supported a high moral standard. The community is made up of church, school, extended family, friends, neighbors, etc. People would point kids in a godly direction. Sometimes when parents failed to be good trainers and examples, their deficiency was, was uh, rectified by grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, governments, and churches. Today you have to be on guard with family, government, schools, and so forth. When I was a kid, everybody in the community, just about, there were some that was exceptions, but almost everybody in the community embraced a biblical, morals, and ethical standard in their life. And when I was a kid, if I said something that was derogatory or uh, that was morally incorrect or something like that, somebody might, might just reach over and slap me across the face or something. And I'm not talking about just at home. I'm talking about in the community. The neighbor down the block and, and the classrooms, the teachers, made their, their kids have uh, good discipline and, and behave themselves in the classroom and so forth. And I will tell you something, they had the highest standard of education back in those days, probably that America's ever seen. Uh, I, I, I'm just saying that because that's what it seems like to me. Uh, I know it was a lot higher than it is today. You know where America, uh, where the state of Nevada stands uh, uh, statewide, if you compare all the states in America, the 50 states, and you compare the standard of education in all 50 states, you know where Nevada set stands in those 50 states? It was 49th, but it just went to 50. Isn't that something? Uh, that's the kind of education that our kids are receiving in public school today. Uh, and so we've got a big job to do. I mean, and, and, and when you think about it, and you really consider it, it's overwhelming. It is really overwhelming when you think about the responsibility that we have as parents. But I'll tell you what, if we pray with our kids, and, and I'm not talking about just in church, I'm talking about in the home, or we pray with our kids and we live by biblical standards and so forth, we're going to have completely different uh, type of kids than what you see in most of our uh, public uh, area today. And so uh, this message is something that I, I really want to share with you. I want to share more about this uh, at least one more Sunday uh, on this and just talk about this and really get down to the, 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 the nitty gritty and talk about these things more because we, I, I, I know that what we're doing in our church is right. I, I really believe that. And, and we're, we've got excellent results from it. Uh, I'm, I could go on about this for quite a while this morning and, and share with you some things. But I'm preaching this message 
to encourage you to keep doing things the way you're doing it, but also that when we have new people come into our church, I want our people in our church to be ready to come alongside. Uh, let's say if we had a family that come in with three or four kids, and they came in and they began to come to our church, and they were sending their kids to public school, and their kids was using words that they sh that nobody should use, and and those, uh, what should you and I do about that? Well, you know what? We need to befriend them, become friends with them, and let them know that we love them. And more than anything else, the example that we set for them is, is the most important thing. And then begin to, the, the kids, you'll be amazed when you begin to get acquainted with other children that your age start coming to our church and how much influence you can have on them. But just don't let them influence you to begin to behave yourselves the way they behave and so forth. And when they first come in, they will seem okay and everything will seem like they're nice kids and, and so forth, but it won't be long, especially when you're away from the, from the group and away from parents, you'll see that they have uh, used the wrong kind of language and the wrong attitudes and and those kind of things, attitudes towards their parents and towards leadership. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this to a close. So, uh, otherwise, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. And so, we need to address this and not just realize that it's the way it is, but we need to, to prepare ourselves to do something about it. So, with that, let us stand this morning. Oh, God is so good, and He wants to bless us, and He wants to really, uh, and, and, and He is blessing us. You know that? We are blessed people. We're, we're a blessed people, and I appreciate each one of you, and I, and I just think that all of us here this morning, we're doing a, a good job, the best job that we can in serving God and, and taking care of our kids, and, and I'm here to come alongside of you and help you in every way that I can. Uh, in your walk with God and, and raising your kids and so forth. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to ask our assistant pastor to dismiss us this morning and bless our food that we're about to partake of. And all sorts of things like this that is contrary to holy, uh, wholesome, holy and wholesome teaching. And we need to be, be very careful that our kids don't get involved in these things. Uh, kids develop very bad spirits, attitudes, and so forth from these chat rooms that they uh, are involved with and, and on their smartphones conversations. Did you know that there's almost an epidemic level of teenage suicide that is caused because of what's happening on these chat rooms, on smartphones, and on the internet? Uh, they will... And I don't know why kids do this. I don't know if it's human nature, but they'll have, they'll begin to pick on one kid in the school, and people will begin to say things about them and so forth. And, and it, it gets so bad that the kids just cannot stand it anymore, and they go out and commit suicide. Uh, and that certainly is not a wholesome thing that's taken place in our communities. Uh, there's bullying and, and, and a lot of other things that takes place there. And so this morning, as we look at this, we need to have a very close control of these things where our kids is concerned. Peers. That kind of goes hand in hand. Some of this all kind of fits together. Uh, it's hard to separate these as individual topics, but peers, kids' peers, other kids at school. Uh, they, uh, school and, and in the neighborhood and so forth. How many kids do you suppose that there is in our, especially our inner cities, that is forced to join gangs? They're forced to join gangs. If they don't, their lives are at stake. And they have to join these gangs in order to have some element of safety. Uh, and this is what's happening in the inner cities in our cities in America. And I don't know what's happening in other cities and other countries, but 
in America, I know that this is happening and, and uh, we see these kind of things. Uh, they, the, uh, I remember when I was uh, going in a little bit different direction than gangs, and still talking about peers, uh, I remember when I was about, let's see, I must have been about 13 years old, somewhere it's about that, 12 or 13, I began to run around with a couple of brothers, a couple of, a couple of guys that were brothers, and we began to run around together, and then there was other kids that we ran around uh, sometimes, especially the, the, the two uh, Buchanan boys that I ran with, lived down the street about a mile from where I did, and so uh, we would run around together, and because of the influence of these boys is the reason I began to smoke cigarettes. Now, how many can, can realize what I'm talking about here? We know that that happens, doesn't it? That's called peer pressure. And you want to fit in. You want to be part of the gang. You want to be uh, liked and, and so forth. And so you begin to do uh, what they do. And pretty soon, uh, I never did this, but uh, uh, pretty soon these that you're running around with, it becomes more than tobacco. Pretty soon it becomes marijuana, and then it becomes stronger drugs and alcohol and and all the other things that kids get involved with at an early age, in spite of what their, their, their uh, parents are telling them, and in spite of everything that the church can do, and so forth, it still happens, and it happens to kids that go to church on a regular basis. And so we need to uh, really, uh, we need to really look at these things that I'm talking about this morning, and we need to be really serious about this. You know what? I, I feel like I'm the most blessed pastor that there is in this area because we have a family integrated <coughs> church here. You don't see us having uh, Sunday school classes, do you? Or those kind of things. Uh, and we're not going to. Uh, more about that in a little bit. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is public schools. Public schools. How many... How much time is spent in churches teaching children about God? How many hours a week do you think that, uh, that is spent teaching the children about God? And I'm talking about what the, the church teaching kids uh, about God. An hour? An uh, hour. How much? Maybe an hour. Maybe an hour. I remember once when... Uh, uh, I wasn't pastoring, I was between pastorates. Uh, we went to a church, and uh, uh, this was in Southern California, and after attending church uh, there for uh, oh, maybe a month, something like that, we attended that church longer than that, but after we'd been going there for about that, that long, I asked my kids, Betty Sue and her brother, I asked them, what did they think about, uh, did they like their Sunday school class that they went to? And you know what they both of them told me? They said, no, they didn't like it because all they did in that Sunday school class was color pictures and, and, uh, and do little projects and things in there. And they was taught almost nothing about the Lord. Uh, I, I can brag here a little bit. I think my kids probably knew more about the Lord than what their teachers did in the Sunday school class anyway. But, uh, and I forget how old they was. They was what, seven, eight years old, and something like that. Uh, and they went to those Sunday school classes, and, and that didn't make me very happy, but I was just preparing and getting things in order to start a church, which I did, and which I pastored for 24 years. And so uh, we, we, we did leave that church, and, and I really liked that pastor. He was a good man, uh, and so forth. But... Let's talk about, let's stay with public schools here. What happens if you spend, let your kids go to church and go to a Sunday school class and learn about the Lord for an hour a week? And then, when you get home, you send your kids out to public school where they're in school for, what, 20 hours a week, maybe? 30? Okay, are they in the classroom that long? No. Six hours a day, five days a week that they're at the school. 
that they're at the school. So if you subtract recess time and the noon break, uh, anyway, uh, you can figure the difference. One hour opposed to 25, 30 hours. And not only uh, is, is that time element different, uh, the amount of time that the kids are being taught in public school compared to being taught in the Sunday school class, then what happens also in there is the Sunday school teacher, she's just a, 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 a good old, you know, one of the good people that loves the Lord and, and all, and she's not uh, professionally trained in most cases and so forth. And they go to school and these kids are told these teachers are, are professionally trained and, and certified and they're qualified to teach and, and so forth. And so when you go to school, you tell your little Johnny or Susie, that uh, when you go to school, you pay attention to the teacher because you're there to get an education. And so you listen to what the teacher says. Well, and then when they get into the, the uh, upper grades and the, the school starts uh, teaching them about evolution and about a lot, a lot of other unscriptural teachings, uh, and you find that uh, Here's some guy that's got a, a white robe on and he's got a clipboard and, and he looks professional and he's uh, introduced to you as, as a kid, he's introduced to you as somebody that's a professional, well-educated, and you're going to listen to him all these hours compared to the one hour uh, that the kids are there in, uh, in Sunday school. Who are the kids going to be influenced by? Why, they're going to be influenced by this guy that's the professional that has this white jacket on and, and the, the clipboard and, and uses these big words that you don't understand, but uh, you're going to really pay attention to him, uh, and that's what your kids are going to be influenced with. Now, is that going to help your, your, your children's spiritual education? Are they going to continue to to, you know, walk with the Lord when they become adults and so forth? Well, not only do we have the, the bad teaching, but we have a great moral decay in our public schools. There's crazy things that's going on, and it's not only in our schools like it was, but it's out into our society. I want to share a story with you, something that really happened, a short story. Uh, about a pastor I know down in Gardnerville, Nevada here. Uh, they, we've all heard about the restroom thing where uh, there's no gender anymore. And they're teaching kids in school today that there's no gender. There's only one gender. Everybody's all the same. And so everybody uses the same restroom and so forth. Well, this pastor went into, and, I, the, the, uh, and I'm going to tell you the story was, it was Walgreens Drugstore. They took the gender signs off of their bathrooms and just put bathroom on the doors or something to identify them as restrooms. And then everybody that wants goes in there. Uh, if there's some sexual pervert that wants to see some, some teenage girl going into a bathroom, he can go right in there after her. Uh, is she safe in a situation like this? Well, this pastor went to uh, the, the drugstore, and as he was checking out, he told the woman behind the counter there, he said, this is my last time that I'm ever going to come in this store, and I want you to tell this to the store manager, because he said, I'm a pastor, and I'm going to pass this on to all the people in my congregation. He said, it's not safe for our young ladies to come into this store, and I want your manager to know that, and we're not going to do this anymore. that Target did the same thing and Target lost a whole lot of sales because of it. I don't know what's happened since then, but he told this young lady that, that uh, behind the counter, he said, take your, my name out of your computer because you'll never bring it up again. I'm not coming back in this store. We need to take a stand like that okay. against some of this ungodly stuff that's going on. So moral decay. Generation identification, uh, the, the lifestyle that uh, we are forced to accept and our kids are being taught in school that homosexuality and lesbianism is okay, 
that uh, that's an acceptable lifestyle uh, in the human race. Well, the Bible says quite differently that. The Bible says it's an abomination, and in the Old Testament, if anybody was caught practicing this type of activity, they was taken outside the city and they were stoned to death. It was capital punishment. The, the penalty for that kind of lifestyle, uh, according to what God decreed, was the death penalty. Uh, now that's how serious it is to the Lord. And it's sad to say that in churches today, that there are many churches that call themselves Christians that says that this is okay. In fact, there's a new church that's just started in Carson City that is a gay church. And uh, they sent uh, information to our, our pastor's prayer group and inviting all of our churches to come and fellowship with them. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you what the answer to that was. Uh, so, the last category that I want to share with you this morning is churches. I want to save that to last. The, uh, I've already talked some about Sunday schools and, and the influence they have on children compared to uh, the public school and so forth. Well, Sunday school, children's church, youth groups, youth programs, and all of those things, you know what they really are? They are a copy of the public school system. And in fact, there's a school, pretty, there's a church, a fairly large church in Carson City that, I don't, I don't know if they went back to it, they had to close it, but they had a K through 12 school. And they set their school up in 12 different age and copied the public school and even used the same uh, textbooks and study helps and everything that the public school was using. They did that because they said, we want, if kids have, that has been in public school comes to attend our church, we want them to be acquainted with what's going on and with the materials and so forth. And that's why they did. They want to copy and be in, in line with the public schools. The public school system is one of the most horrible things that there is in our society. Uh, I've heard many people call it a, a, a cesspool for kids. And that's really uh, a, a terrible thing that is part of our society and the law says you have to educate your kids. Now let me, let me be clear on this. I believe in education. I think we should get as much education as we possibly can. But there's other ways to get education besides public school. And so as we look at this, we, uh, we can see what's happening in these public schools. And I've already talked about peer pressure. Well, the biggest place for peer pressure for your kids is in the public school grounds and in the classroom and so forth. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, when I was in school, if you disbehaved in the classroom, you know what would happen to you? And I'll never forget the time my teacher made me bend over and swatted me on my behind with a paddle about that long and about that wide. And I'll tell you what, it straightened me out. Uh, now I know that there's been abuse in, in classrooms uh, from some teachers, but they're the minority. that. Most teachers was just trying to maintain order and discipline in the school. But we've thrown discipline out the window in our society. We really have, not only in schools, but at just about every part of our society. We've thrown school, all that out. And you can see, uh, you know, the Bible says, whatsoever uh, that you sow, that shall you also reap. Well, we're reaping the benefits of some of these liberal uh, ways and attitudes that there is in our society today. It really is, and it's getting worse and it's not going to get better. I don't care how many laws that they pass and, and so forth. I just uh, I seen Andy reading a newspaper there this morning and I just noticed the headlines that California uh, feels like they have to make stricter gun laws than what they have now. They want to get stricter gun Can you imagine that? Uh, so, anyway, we look at this and, and we look at the churches 
And, and let me be fair with churches. I think churches are doing everything that they think that they can to help children. I, I know that there's, there's programs in churches. Uh, they, they do everything they can to, uh, to educate kids for the Lord in their, in their youth uh, programs and, and all of these things. And they really try. They're very serious. And they're really doing everything that they can, but they're going about it wrong. That is where the problem's at. Uh, and, and I fellowship with these ministers, and all the churches I fellowship, as far as I know, every single one of them has the youth programs and Sunday schools and all this sort of thing. But I, I just would like for them to realize, take a look at the results of these programs that they're having, and when do these, these children, what happens to the children in their church once they become adults and they get out on their own and decide for themselves? What percentage of those children uh, that goes to those churches are still serving the Lord and, uh, and going to church and living a, a godly life? Uh, I don't remember what the statistics is, but it's something like 7% or... Yeah, something like that. Something like 7%. I want to get the, I tried to find those statistics yesterday when I was putting this message together, but it's uh, uh, for, and, and, and I'm just talking about kids that go to church on a regular basis. I'm not talking about the other church just, just go uh, now and then and goes to these churches. So, I, here's the situation. We have three different places I wanna, that I want to share with you about education for kids. There's public schools, then there's private schools, and there's homeschooling. Now, those are the three main methods of educating children in our country today. And if you look at those, we have the statistics, and again, I want to get, get those together and share them with you. Uh, hopefully next week if I can find those those statistics, but those statistics for kids that, and, and, and all of these statistics Address kids that goes to church on a regular basis If they go